Good morning, everyone. My name is Ariel Valdez. I use she, they, and a pronouns, and I am the Education and Training Coordinator over at Jane Doe, Inc., the Massachusetts Coalition Against Sexual Assault and Domestic Violence. Thank you for taking the time today to um, watch our Five Things segment. This month, we are focusing on advocates, and our um, today is part one of our conversation, Sustaining Ourselves, a Conversation with Advocates. Today, we have Amanda Mitchell from New Hope, Inc., and Rainy Kaufman from the Center for Hope and Healing. Amanda and Rainy, thank you for being with us today. Um, and I'd love to invite Amanda to introduce yourself, tell us a little about a little bit about the program, um, your program and the services that they offer, etc. Hello, thanks uh, for having me. Uh, my name is Amanda. My pronouns are she and her. Um, I work for New Hope Inc. Um, I've been there for 15 years. My uh, specific uh, duties involve um, our safe plan, court advocacy program and uh, our civilian police advocacy program. Um, and I supervise those programs at the agency. Um, one of the things that New Hope um, has, um, has uh, done is really try to uh, provide advocates in um, all of the courts uh, to be, and we serve uh, eight courts uh, throughout uh, lower Worcester County and Upper Bristol County. New Hope also has um, two confidential domestic violence shelters. We have uh, programs that work with um, intimate partner um, violence and self-respect program. We have a counseling program. We have a visitation center and that's located in Worcester. We have uh, housing advocates and community-based advocates and several other uh, programs that uh, really do work to help uh, the folks within our catchment area. Uh, and it's, it's my pleasure to, to work there and, and, and to have been there for as long as I have. So I'm, I'm grateful to be here as well. Thank you, Amanda. Rainy, uh, tell the people who you are and what you do. Hi, I am Rainy. I use she and they series pronouns. Um, and I am the LGBTQNT advocate um, and community educator at the Center for Hope and Healing in Lowell, Massachusetts. Um, specifically, I work within the Hope Prevents sector of our organization. We are um, a sexual violence organization um, center. And we have two kind of parts to things. We have survivor services and we have Hope Prevents. So I do a lot of community education. I run a youth group with LGBTQ and T folks who I absolutely adore. Um, and I collaborate with different folks on doing a variety of things. Um, our organization has a ton of services as well. We have a 24 hour hotline. Um, we have a web chat service that can remain completely anonymous if necessary. That is open from 12 to 5 p.m. Um, we have legal advocacy, we have um, healing circles, counseling, uh, we have Driving Hope, which is our fancy little van that goes around, posts up at some of the little community um, organizations and has, you know, swag and other PPE type stuff, type stuff, excuse me. Um, but yeah, that's kind, of, that's kind of where I'm at with the Center for Hope and Healing. And thank you for having me. I'm really excited to be here today. Thank you so much for being here. So in case anyone's familiar with the five things format, um, I, this month we are dedicating it to individual advocates um, in preparation for our, our Advocates in Directors Institute uh, running June 23rd through the 25th. And one of our helpful um, tech folks from behind the scenes will drop the link for you in the chat. Um, but feel free to check that out and we hope we'll be able to see you there. Going forward, um, we have a couple of questions and I would love to invite Rainy to start us off. Rainy, um, how do you show up in the movement? 
and the movement being the movement to end sexual assault and domestic violence, but also if you are part of other movements, um, feel free to share that with us as well. Definitely, thank you. Um, so the way that I show up to really any movement that I'm involved in is I show up with joy and I show up with humility. Um, and I know it sounds kind of funny to say that I show up with joy to something as serious and as potentially traumatic as talking about, you know, like sexual and domestic violence. But the reason why I say that I show up with joy is because there are so many folks who have gone through these extremely difficult things and are still full of hope and are still so looking forward to healing. Um, and also the folks who I get to work with are so driven and so motivated to do this kind of nitty gritty work that's, you know, with the community and be with folks who they truly, truly care about, even if they've never met them before. Um, so I show up with a lot of joy because I know that there are people who are very serious about this work who really want to see change. And I think that's a beautiful thing. Um, and I show up with humility because I know that folks are the experts on their own experience. And there are a lot of things in our society and in our culture that tell us the only way that you can be an expert on something is if you know you have like 14 different degrees, you've been, you know, like working for, you know, 30 years plus, you've done like XYZ, you know, and it's all it's all, you know, there in order to keep um, the people who are in like the community down in a way, you know, and I show up with humility because I want to learn from every single person who I get to work with. Um, and I want to be able to take that away and be able to um, apply it to any and all of the work that I do in any movement. Um, and I think that it's so important to be able to be in the community and to be able to learn from all the folks that I am also serving. Um, and then lastly, I show up with my whole self. I show up with all of my intersecting identities, with being queer, with being multiracial, with being a survivor, with being um, a transplant from Southern California. All of these things come into play um, when I am doing whatever work I'm doing. And I try to use every single experience that I've had to either uh, garner empathy or sympathy as I can apply it to the work that I am doing on a day-to-day -day basis. I definitely hear you on the humility bit. Um, definitely keeping it humble and knowing that every moment is, uh, is a moment for learning, especially uh, with the folks that you come in contact with. How about you, Amanda? For me, I show up as someone who has had 15 years of experience of doing this work. Um, but I've also worked with other populations um, that have experienced different things. One of the things that I've done prior to doing this particular work is working with women in prison and it's always shaped my perspective of how much the system has impacted those who from a very young age have been victimized, disenfranchised, placed on the margins, you name it. Um, I show up as someone who is a woman of color. I show up as someone who has grown up in situations where you know, as a child myself, I've witnessed domestic violence. I show up as someone who has a hope that I'm going to continue to impact people no matter what I do. I've moved across different positions since I've been doing this work. And it's always interesting to see how no matter where you are, you still can have an impact, whether you're a brand new advocate or whether you're someone who's had 20, 30 years of experience in doing this work you still have impact. For me, it's always amazing to see what uh, little things um, play a part in how someone heals, how someone comes to safety, how someone 
um, even expresses gratitude for the work that you do. It's amazing to me to see that transformation that happens when someone is no longer having to walk on eggshells in their own home and then somehow they're able to find that peace uh, and, and looking at yourself as an advocate that might have worked with that person, you see, wow, I played a small part in that. I was able to help in some small way. And I come from a perspective of wanting to continue to have that feeling, no matter what small part I play in someone's journey. I wanna always take stock of that. I wanna always look at that and always keep that at the forefront that no matter what, you're contributing in some way. You're in this movement and you're important. And that's what I try to keep at the forefront of just keeping that, I, I mean, I appreciate when you talked about humility, that, that keeps me humble, that keeps me wanting to continue, that keeps me fresh focused, um, is just recognizing that people come from all places. Uh, you never know what someone's journey has begun. In the past work that I've done, uh, working with women in prison, one of the we, we've done polls and one of the main things that you discovered in working with them is that they've been majority of them, 85% of them have been victims as, as children and it shaped how they grew into adults. And neither one of us is very far removed from that kind of situation. And it helps me and the correlations Domestic and sexual violence, the correlations for all aspects of life, how it impacts life uh, of victims is just, it's so broad. You can also make those same correlations when you look at systemic racism and you look at misogyny and you look at all of the things that our society is, is pushing out right now. All those things have such an impact starting at such a young age. And you realize that even though you might in some cases come across this person as an adult, um, treating them with dignity, treating them with the respect that they deserve, being there for that, that important moment in their life, no matter what it is, uh, staying present, that's, that's, that's where I try to stay and that's where I'm, I'm coming from as an advocate. Thank you so much, Amanda. So I hear the, the very beginnings of your story, at least when uh, it comes to being involved in the movement to end sexual assault and domestic violence. I hear that um, you really got your start um, in working with women who were incarcerated or formerly incarcerated at this point. Um, I would love to learn a little bit more about what is your advocacy journey, um, especially as I believe are uh, 15 years in, is that correct? Yes, that's, that's correct. It's been um, a very eye-opening journey. Uh, you come into this with a bit of naivete, I have to say in my case. Um, I definitely was awakened to a lot more as I started to do this work. And, and one of the things I mentioned was looking at how children who are impacted by domestic and sexual violence, how it broadens their whole perspective in a way that's either jaded or one that could potentially uh, cause uh, them to want to take up this as a cause, to really want to run uh, with some sort of advocacy or some sort of um, in, be, be involved in some, some movement that, that perpetuates change, systemic change. Um, as I worked with women who in this case had been imprisoned, like I said, a lot of it came from being victims as children, experiencing domestic violence, being in homes where uh, domestic violence or sexual violence was prevalent, being victims that in some cases no one believed um, there have been many of my clients who talked about in the past experiencing sexual violence, in particular at the hands of someone who was a caretaker, um, a step parent, someone who was a relative in their life, 
and no one believed it or they were encouraged not to talk about it because it's a quote unquote family secret. Uh, these things really impacted me as someone who was young at the time hearing their stories and wanting to do so much to help them and to help them work through these things. And then, you know, anyone who works in that field knows that the moment that these things impact you as a child, it impedes your growth. So you have women who physically might be in their thirties or forties, mentally and emotionally might be 12. Uh, so it's always interesting and always amazing to me to see that in spite of the things that they've gone through, the amount of resilience that, that was there, the amount of still getting up every day, still moving, still when you had no one, in some cases being disowned by a parent who didn't believe what you had to say. Um, those things impacted me. Um, so when I crossed over into working at New Hope and doing this work specifically, I got my start at court. I was a court advocate um, in one of the courts here in Bristol County. And it, again, coming into a situation, being still naive about the way the systems work, but wanting so much to change, wanting to see where people could go, how they could be safe, how they could still maintain their dignity. Um, I, I definitely have learned a lot and grown a lot and seen how as someone who has never been in the system can come into a court, for example, and be completely lost, especially if you're dealing with a traumatic situation and you have no one there who could potentially help you navigate that. Advocates play such a crucial part. And I realized that so much in doing that specific work that this is the first person that they might have talked to who fully believes them. And it's always kept me humble about people's journeys. So that first beginning to now, in spite of everything, and, and we all know that there are disappointments in doing the work, but in spite of everything, I think about the little victories that I've been able to help people gain. And it's really kept me sustained. Being able to look and see okay, I've, I've helped with that. This person's here because of that. And now in a lot of the cases that I look at, it's I've helped these advocates be able to help this person. I've helped this group be able to help this person. I've educated this group to be able to help this situation. And it's, it's more of a global scale. But I think about those early days. I think about one person in particular that I helped whose husband nearly killed her. I remember at one point, she was completely covered in bruises and it was a very uh, traumatic situation. And I remember when I first talked to her, she could barely talk, she could barely move. It was such a really, it was a horrific situation. But I remember some weeks later seeing her and she had been able to seek services and, and, and get the help that she needed. And I remember seeing her face and the bruises were gone. And I remember her looking at me and saying, I wanted you to see me. I wanted you to see me like this. This is me. I wanted you to see I'm okay. It really, that's, that's forever stood out to me. And then that, that right there was one thing that I took away. And it's always been able to be at the back of my mind that, yeah, if I can help with that, if I can do that, I can continue to do so much more for people. And I try to stay on that, that wavelength and, and let that motivate me. Thank you so much, Amanda. Rainey, um, would you tell us a little bit about your advocacy journey? I would love to. Um, Amanda, that anecdote that you shared is just, oh my goodness. It just makes you wanna like take a deep breath. It's so, so beautiful to be able to witness change and to witness the effect of the work that you're doing in such a, you know, almost jarring way. Um, 
And the juxtaposition just allows you to see the beauty of the work that you're doing because you get to really be with folks through these super difficult times and see them grow and heal and you know be the people that they deserve to be able to be outside of any abuse or anything like that. Um, yeah, I just that's just such a beautiful anecdote and I really am grateful that you are sharing it and that you shared it. Um, for my advocacy journal, jur oh, not journal, my goodness, my advocacy journey, <laughs> um, you know, it's a mixture of a lot of things that um, I've experienced for my entire life. I grew up in a place where there wasn't anyone who really shared the same identity as me, except for maybe, you know, my brothers who were blood related. So, you know, we um, did experience the same kind of you know, ins and outs of being biracial. Um, my mom is a Cambodian immigrant. She came in 1981 um, after the really brutal regime of the Khmer Rouge. And she is one of the strongest people I know and probably my favorite person in the world. I say that with a question mark sometimes because I'm like, I don't wanna, you know, put anyone else down, but I love my mom so much. Um, and her culture, what she brought to the US and what she then brought to our family. Um, and my dad is a Norwegian man who's also kind of first generation. So we had this like really fun, beautiful, like, you know, amalgamation of all of these interesting experiences. But um, we were with my family a lot growing up and there was, there was so much, you know, she was one of 10. Um, and so I have a lot of cousins, I have a lot of aunties, a lot of uncles and, you know, I didn't have a word for it when I was a kid, but the intergenerational trauma of having a parent and having family members who have gone through genocide is extremely real. Um, and that was never something that was talked about, right? And so moving through my life as a kid, I realized that there were like kind of these certain things going on. I'm also someone who um, has struggled with mental illness their entire life um, and you know, because we lived in such a culture of silence when it came to talking about trauma, when it came to talking about mental illness, I didn't have a lot of guidance. So as I got older and I was able to network and reach out and find folks to be my own, you know, little community, I was able to find out that I was extremely passionate about identity, especially because I didn't have that representation when I was younger and I didn't have like people to really confide in. It felt like who would understand my experience on a very complex level. Um, so I found out I was extremely passionate about identity. I was extremely passionate about understanding why systems of oppression are at work and what they do. And Amanda, I think you just did such an incredible job of talking about it when you were addressing, you know, like your work with folks who have been imprisoned and incarcerated, um, the systemic oppression and the way that, you know, all of these things operate in order to keep folks who are already oppressed, still oppressed and just, you know, create this divide, you know. Um, and I mean, also we all know no one is liberated until um, we get, oh wait, no, I messed that up, but I digress. Um, <laughs> um, so, I think just like talking about all of the systemic oppression and learning about all of the systemic oppression and how we can find liberation and how we can find liberation in its unique ways for every single different person became very important to me because liberation looks different for everyone, right? You can't just have one static form of freedom or one static form of um, helping someone because everyone is so unique and because I felt so alone sometimes, if I'm being completely honest as a kid, I think it really drove me to want to understand how everyone needed a unique perspective and able to heal and able to grow and able to overcome systems of oppression that didn't allow us to, you know, find liberation in the ways that we are seeking it. And so because of all of this, um, because of this, these just like multitudes of complex identities around me and within myself, I was driven to go to school to learn about these things. And I know I was talking about like academia before, like, nah, you know, academia, whatever, like, um, and we all expect people to go to college and everybody to get a job. 
you know, I, I personally do love school, so don't worry. Um, <laughs> and I think that school is very valuable. I also just think it should be accessible. Um, I, I was able to, you know, learn so many things about systemic racism, about homophobia and how, you know, they all intermingle with each other. And it's so, you know, unfortunately real. And so many of us have faced it and learning about all of this allowed me to kind of take a step back and be like, okay, I have had this really intensely beautiful experience of being able to kind of explore my identity and learn about all of these like really complicated things that, you know, there are so many huge academic terms for when you um, talk about like various struggles within either the movement or just within like your community work. Um, and I was able to take a step back and just kind of think like, what do I want to do now? How do I want to apply this? Because I realized just being in school, I wasn't feeling fulfilled. And when I was feeling fulfilled, it was when I was with my community. It was when I was working on education. It was when I was working with my youth and I got to do that throughout college. And then once I finished my master's degree out here, I was able to, again, take a step back and be like, okay, I've gotten this like lovely experience of being able to talk to folks who have all this knowledge, this wealth of knowledge, and I've gotten to absorb it because I have so much privilege in that. I was able to get a secondary edu um, upper education, and that was a beautiful thing. And then for me, after finishing that, I was like, okay, now it's time to take the step back. I'm going to get out of academia, and I'm going to take all of these things that I've learned and I want to apply it in a way that is accessible and that makes sense in praxis because I don't wanna just be this person who's like talking about things but isn't actually on the ground, you know, doing the work to actually um, uproot the systemic causes of violence, systemic oppressions that exist. Um, and yeah, so that's kind of how I came to be an advocate because I had always wanted to help people um, I had always wanted to be in a space where I could teach and where I could learn simultaneously. Um, and I've really gotten to do that through being an advocate and it's hard and it's, you know, very emotional sometimes. And it is so intensely rewarding, like you said, Amanda, with the little things and the big things. It is just so fulfilling and I'm grateful to be in it and grateful to be able to apply what I do know and continue to grow and learn within it. I appreciate you, Rainey. Um, I have so much to learn from you still. That's the thing. Never too late to learn anything. And I have so, so, so much to learn still. Um, I appreciate all that you shared, definitely. Thank you both so much for sharing. I would pop up the slide, but I'm having some technical difficulties. However, I do remember our third point and our third question. Um, Rainey, I'd love to start with you about, uh, so you just recently began your advocacy journey in, in this particular movement. What do you wish you had known before you started? Yeah, so I, like you said, Ariel, I started my advocacy journey um, just back in November. I graduated during COVID, I got a job during COVID, and boy, was that an experience. Um, but I got the joy and the opportunity, this like lovely opportunity to be a part of an organization that I really, really care about and that I'm really excited to be with. Um, and I think um, just one thing that I did wish that I knew before I got into um, advocacy work and before I started advocacy work is that, you know, not every story is going to be a success story. Um, and you can do everything quote unquote right, right, or what you think is right. And you can still have a negative impact on someone and you can still hurt people. And it's, it's so difficult to kind of come to terms with that, I think, because I feel like many of the folks, if not all of the folks that I've met who work in advocacy work want to help, right? They want to be there. They want to be 
as supportive as possible. So many people I know would probably like if they were asked to be work 24 seven, like for two weeks straight, they would just be like, you know what? Okay, fine. If that's what my community needs, I'll do it. Um, and it's really, it's really tough when you do um, all these things and you go out of your way to do um, a ton of things that feel like the right moves to make and they still end up being the wrong moves. Um, and I think coming to terms with that is a very difficult thing. And I think that I, I did wish that I knew that. And I wish that I had experienced that a little bit before my advocacy work, which I mean, in your day-to-day -day life, you do experience it to some degree. Um, but sometimes it just feels a lot more heavy when it feels like it's someone's life at stake or someone's livelihood at stake, right? Um, and because of this, you know, I've, I'm, again, so lucky to be a part of an organization that is really committed to also self-care, forgiveness, growth, and these things. And so I constantly have to just work on forgiving myself and work on, you know, saying it's not always perfect. You're not always going to help someone. You're not always going to be that person who makes this huge impact in a positive way. And, you know, you got to just kind of pick yourself up and keep on going because there are other folks who are going to be reaching out to you who are going to um, find the things that you are doing helpful. And it's a learning process. Ariel, I actually remember this is like from a while ago, but I attended a panel and um, with JDI and there was like this one moment where someone was just like a little bit upset about something that was said and you just so beautifully like segued and you were like, you know, we are just always in a space of learning and it is difficult to hear something, you know, that is upsetting. And I'm committed to growth. I'm committed to, you know, moving forward and making sure that it is better next time. And that's sometimes all that we can do. And I think that that comment actually really encapsulated the advocacy work that we have to do. We just always have to commit to going forward and to growing and to learning from what we may have done wrong with whoever it was. I personally echo a lot of what Rainey said. I appreciate the honesty and, you know, just the vulnerability with what you said, because there is a certain level of, so first of all, what I, I wish someone would have told me before I started doing this work is that there's several things. Number one, that there are going to be setbacks. Number two, you're gonna make mistakes. Number three, that there are gonna be cases that linger in your mind and you just can't get them out because they're so impactful. Um, it's difficult when you spend a lot of time working with someone only to find that they go back into a situation that is harmful to them, that they go back to someone who's been abusing them um, you invest so much time in wanting to help people become their best selves, become safe, become uh, what, you know, the, the very thing that you do as an advocate, you want to help them to advocate for themselves. You're talking about situations where people have never really been able to think for themselves or do things for themselves that they, that they, they ought to have been able to do, um, who've never had the opportunity in this particular relationship to, to have a healthy give and take. Um, so it's it's difficult. And as a young advocate, it used to really hurt me that, oh my God, how could you go back to that? Why? It used to really bother me until I understood that it can take someone up to 10 times before they're ready to leave that situation. Whether fortunately or unfortunately, it can really be a sort of merry-go-round, right? Isn't that the cycle of domestic violence? I mean, isn't that something that tends to happen in these relationships? Isn't that something that you sign up to do as an advocate is to help someone no matter what? No matter, you give them all the information, they could very well go back to that situation, you know this, and it's really uh, preparing yourself for that in inevitability in some cases. To talk about the mistakes, Rainy brought up an important point of forgiving yourself. When you make a mistake with someone and there will be mistakes and there've been plenty that I've made 
uh, situations where I thought what was best for a person really wasn't. What you know ended up happening was that person might have resented me for it. There are situations where even if I didn't make a mistake, even if I did everything right, that person may blame me because now they've got this rift there in their relationship. Well, if I would have never filed a restraining order, if you would have never pressured me to file the restraining order, I wouldn't be in this situation. And so the other thing with that is you have to prepare that as an advocate, sometimes it's a thankless job. Yes, you do it for the right reasons. Yes, you do it because you wanna help someone but there are plenty of situations where they're not gonna thank you. They're not gonna be happy with you and they're not going to do the things that you recommend. So that's tough. And another aspect of doing this job that no one really prepares you for is if you lose someone that you work with. In my case, I've lost people that I've worked with, people that I've helped. I've had situations where people were murdered and that's not a good feeling. You have to really work through that. I've had situations where um, someone that, I mean, one of the most impactful situations in my uh, long time of doing this was having a young woman commit suicide the, the day after I, I worked with her. I mean, I had spent all day with this young woman only to find that, wow, different things had happened over the course of the night and then we lost her. And so as an advocate, you think about, did I do everything right? Did I tell this person everything they needed to, to hear? Did I, did I step in in a way that, that I was able to, to provide some comfort to her? Did I, did I do enough? And that's, that's gonna always sit with you. There are gonna always be those cases that linger in the back of your mind because you feel so much empathy cases in particular that involve children are always tough. And you've really, kind of like what Rainey said, you've really got to take care of yourself in doing this work because it's, it's not easy. And if you don't take care of yourself and you don't take the time to embed self-care, it will really weigh you down. But there are so many rewards. At the end of the day, yes, there are moments where things hurt and where things are not going to plan so to speak. But there are also those victories. There are also those situations where people come out on the other side. There are also those situations where you, you, you work with someone who couldn't even make eye contact with you in the beginning. And then you see them a year later at a return hearing at court and they're a completely different person. I live for that. And, um, and because of that, that, that's the kind of thing that sustains me in doing this work is seeing the victories. Thank you, Amanda. I just want to take a moment to hold that. Um, uh, both you and Rainey's very impactful sharing. You've, uh, Amanda, you kind of um, touched upon it, how you take care of yourself through self-care and what exactly sustains you, including uh, the little victories that do as well. Um, I just want to switch, uh, pivot a little bit and ask you, what else sustains you and gives you hope as you do this work? Uh, and I'll start off with Amanda. Other things that sustain me uh, in doing this work, I mean, we both kind of touched on it, Rainy and I, and I just self-care. I, I, I can't say it enough that advocates have a tendency to sort of work themselves to the bone in a lot of situations because it's just, okay, if I can send that one, that, that email, I can help that one client. I can be, you know, in this situation and help out with this situation. I can do this one, you know, set of um, uh, advocacy or outreach or whatever the case may be. Um, and we don't really think about how those little things add up over time. Self-care is so important in this kind of work because I know it sounds like such a cliche, self-care, 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 but we don't do it. We don't do it. We say it, 
we intend to, but we don't do it enough. Uh, I think to sustain yourself, you have to have self-care embedded in what you're doing. Whether it's, I think Rainey had said before at one point, um, whether you, you do something little for yourself, whether it's a big gesture for yourself, yeah, you need to do grand gestures for yourself. You have to really take the time, take the vacation, take the moment, sip your coffee, whatever the case may be. Those are sustainable things. Those help you to get through to the next thing. Um, if you've had a busy day, I know lately everything is zoom, 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 zoom and go. Um, take time in between each one. Don't schedule them so back to back. And I've been guilty of this. Um, it's, it's really about sustaining yourself for the long haul because you think that you can do that one thing in the moment, but what you don't realize is that one thing you did in this moment because you didn't take the time to think about how it impacts you, affects you in the long haul. And so not only that, I rely on supervision. We have a supervision model in the way that we operate at New Hope. Um, that can be very helpful when you have someone, your own personal built-in listener. And that's really what it should be. It should be emphasis on listening first, advice later. Um, and I think if we utilize those models that are put in place for advocates, we really can do this work for the long haul, but it really does take not only looking at the victories, not beating yourself up about the losses, taking the time for yourself, including little self-care things, whether it's throughout your day or whether you plan it for the week, whether you do things on the weekend, whether you do things um, like take vacations and go. I mean, I'd love to take a tropical vacation right now, honestly. Um, those things, all uh, the combination of things help to sustain. I think about how I've been able to do this for as long as I have that's why. Not that it's been perfect, not that I've done it exactly right, um, but I've learned over time that this is what, this is the thing that is going to help me stay um, focused on, on what I need to be. I hear you, Amanda. Let that be a reminder to all of us to remember to take our well-deserved time, paid time off. Um, <laughs> especially as we enter into the summer. How about you, Rainey? Um, what sustains you and what gives you hope as you do this work? I'm over here right now, just thinking about how Amanda wants to go on a tropical vacation. I'm like, it's so hot in Massachusetts right now. I am on a tropical vacation. I am just glistening with tropical, tropical, sheen if you will <laughs> but yeah no I think Amanda really really tackled the you know really the core of why self-care is so important and yeah it does kind of sound cliche I feel like it's just thrown around you go on TikTok you go on Instagram you go on Twitter you go on Facebook you go on whatever everyone's like self-care put on a mask self-care you know I'm gonna I don't know do a do a spa day with my best friend and it is so important. Um, and it's just been, I think it's so beautiful that so many people are talking about it right now because it is such an important thing in order to sustain ourselves, in order to continue doing the work that we're doing. Um, and like you said, Amanda, it is the little and the big things. It's me remembering to do yoga every day, which I have not been good at recently. <laughs> um, it's me making my bed every day because I love how it feels just walking into my room and seeing my bed made. It makes me feel calmer. And I actually notice these little things, you know, that affect the way that I'm able to go through my day. Because honestly, if I'm sitting at my desk or what have you, you know, especially working from home and I go into my room and I see that my bed is a mess, which I'm not going to lie right now it is. Um, <laughs> I'm just like, oh, you know, like I get that like Ugh, feeling and I'm like, I just need to do this. So it's those little things that keep me in my routine and keep me structured um, within self-care that really do sustain me. Um, and also the bigger things, taking a vacation, going away for the weekend, 
just I, I just got to go to a baby shower with two of my really good friends who are having a baby. And it was so lovely. We fished. We just sat by the water. I checked my phone maybe like three, four times. I have not felt that relaxed in such a long time, you know? Um, and, and these things are just so important. And as like tedious, I guess, as it gets to just hear self-care from ev coming from every which way, it's also so great, I think, to get that just kind of constant reminder. And it's even more important to actually act on those reminders. Um, and then something else that sustains me, I get to work with youth um, once a week. I think I mentioned that I run an LGBTQ and T youth group with my organization and they're just so incredible. Um, they're so strong, they're so passionate. They're just, I mean, they have access now because you know, we have the internet, we have, I mean, I feel like I sound so funny. We have the internet, of course we have the internet, but um, the youth that I get to work with have such an, uh, a wealth of knowledge right in front of them. And so they are so informed, which is good and bad, right? You know, they get a lot of misinformation and they get a lot of really good information. So working with the youth that I get to work with, they teach me so much. I learned so much about gender and sexuality from them because it's ever changing and they are at the forefront of all of these changes. Um, and it's just like really great to be able to be with them. And I mean, I have youth who are maybe like in their freshman year of high school and they're already like, I'm going to med school. I've planned out all these things. And I'm like, your drive is what I love. I love seeing it. It's so lovely. Um, my coworkers also sustain me. Uh, they are so dedicated and so passionate. Um, and, you know, I think going through life, you work certain jobs that maybe you're not quite as passionate about, or, you know, it's, it's hard to be passionate about like working at a movie theater, for example, if you're like not really into film or anything like that. And it's hard to be passionate about sweeping up popcorn <laughs> in that aspect of things. But the folks who I work with, it whenever I meet with them, they are just so driven and so, you know, motivated by the work that they are doing. Um, and it's just, it's such a encouraging and supportive environment to be in. And I know that they really, really care about what they're putting out. And that's so important to me because it keeps me um, motivated to be really, really, um, you know, just excited about what I get to do and how I get to, co to collaborate with folks. Um, and also I think like another thing which I'm still learning is how important boundary setting is. Um, and boundary setting is probably one of the hardest things for me to figure out. And I, I know a lot of other people who struggle with it as well because we live in a culture that says it's just always go, 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 go you know, and being able to just take a second and be like, nope, it's 5 p.m. I'm closing my laptop. That email can wait until tomorrow. It's so hard. And I don't know why it's so hard, but it really is. Um, and so boundary setting is something that I am continuously learning and continuously trying to perfect um, because it really, it is something that keeps me, you know, level-headed. Like you said, Amanda, it keeps me from burning out. Um, and it keeps folks that I know from burning out as well. Um, and then also I engage in other like things to just kind of channel my emotions. Like I said, I do yoga. I love yoga, I love stretching. And I love the breathing that goes with it. It helps center me. Um, and I love painting. I do, you know, like little things like that, just keeping up with my hobbies, going out into the yard, checking out my garden, getting bit by 50 mosquitoes in 10 minutes, you know? It's just those things that keep me going. Um, so yeah, that's kind of what sustains me and keeps me keeps me hopeful as I continue with this work. I appreciate that, Rainey, because boundaries are very important, very important. And it's interesting. My one little blip about that is the pandemic has really stretched us in terms of boundaries because for so many of us, we 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 work from home. Uh, we've been working from home since the pandemic. Some of us are on hybrid models. Some of us have gone back to our offices and things. Um, <laughs> but, you know, I found that over time I had to find a dedicated spot for work, especially those who don't have a natural office in their home. It's like, ooh, what's my dedicated spot going to be? Because if I look at it, I'm going to want to do it. I'm going to want to 
you know, mess with this or send this email or tinker with, tinker with something. And, and it's just, nope, you got to leave it at that specific spot and not touch it when it's time to turn it off. Uh, but it's been hard to do uh, because you're at home and you're on Zoom or you're on meetings or whatever, and you have children or you have pets or you have your home life is intermingling with your work life. And that, that's, that's been a challenge during the pandemic uh, as well. Um, but it's, it's, always, it's always important to keep, keep that boundary there. That was such a great point. It's the pandemic has really just like completely muddled up our literal physical boundaries too. And I totally feel that sometimes I'm working and I'll see dirty dishes and I'm like, I'm just going to go and do this dish really quickly. Um, and it's just so funny how that has happened. And it's just really uprooted a lot of the ways that we kept work and home separate. And now everything is just all mashed together. And you're like, oh my goodness, I can't escape. <laughs> Absolutely. I feel like that what you've both said ha will resonate well with so many people. Um, and it's it's a little bit funny that um, us as advocates sometimes have a difficult time setting boundaries when part of our empowerment work and part of our prevention education work is uh, trying to teach and uh, work with the people that we work with on setting healthy safe boundaries but you know what we aren't perfect we are also works in progress um so love i love what both of you just shared we are going to move on to our last question uh, i know this one is a little bit daunting we've gone uh back and forth a little bit uh as we have pre prepared for those five things but uh, I know you all can do it, and I know I've heard your responses before, and they've all been lovely. So um, let's start off with Rainy. Rainy, what is the legacy that you want to leave behind in this work? I think I mentioned this the first time that we really talked about this question, but sometimes it feels so funny talking about a legacy because I literally just got into the work. Um, but I think if I were to leave behind anything, you know, I want people to know that it is okay to mess up. It is always a process. It's always a learning and growing process. Just like both of you have said, we're always here trying to get better, trying to do better. And there's kind of this like air of never being satisfied because we know there's always space to grow. And I think that it's really cool that, you know, someone like me, who's, a, who's been working in advocacy for less than a year, and someone like Amanda, who has this like wealth of experience, um, can both sit here and say, I'm still learning, and I'm still growing, and I still want to learn and perfect what I'm doing, and I may never reach that perfection, and that's okay, as long as I'm continuing to strive to do better, and I think that's so intensely important, um, and then also, I want people to meet me and see me and know that I am showing up in my whole authentic self as my big, loud, kind of goofy person. Um, and I mess up and that's okay. Again, it's about learning and growing. I completely messed up my quote from earlier. I was like, oh, this goes so well with it. And then my brain was just like, you're not saying that now. And I was like, you know what? It happens. Um, and I want people to know that. I am okay with seeing myself kind of flounder sometimes and that I have gone through a lot in order to really be happy and be really strong and um, steadfast in who I am, even though sometimes it changes. Um, but I want people to take that away and be like, you know, I saw Rainy the other day at this JDI panel or at like their pride book club and they were just out there and I could tell that they were being truly themselves and I want to do that too. And that's all that I can really ask for at the end of the day. I again appreciate Rainy so much because I mean you are your true authentic self and we all need to be like that. Um, 
and you're working with youth, I think it's so important to pass on what we know to our youth. I don't, unfortunately, personally get to work a lot with youth uh, in doing what I'm doing now, but we do have an education and outreach team. Uh, we do have you know, other programming that does more work with youth, including a youth counselor um, at New Hope. And it's always, um, <laughs> it's always interesting and fun to see someone as young as five and six. I remember a specific day when there was like a gaggle of kids in the office. Um, and uh, it was a bunch of little boys and you know they were waiting to see one of the counselors and it was just like, oh my goodness, how fun is that? Look at them like interacting uh, with each other. And uh, you know, it just, it's just, I mean, looking at kids and looking at the youth and seeing how much promise there is. For me, that's the thing is wanting to, wanting to leave the movement with people who are going to continue to do the work wanting to see um, how much growth, wanting to see um, even in myself, like the continued learning, um, recognizing that I haven't arrived. I never will arrive. I don't know everything that I need to know, that I ought to know. I want to know, but I don't. And so continuing to learn from other people, um, continuing to ask those pertinent questions, continuing to, um, you know, what's the saying, each one teach one, wanting to be a mentor to people that are coming after me and hopefully leaving something behind with the things that I'm able to impart with them is important to me. Wanting to set an example, wanting to make sure that that passion is still there um, that I've been able to help in some way, some small way impart that in someone else. Even if it's just one person, um, being able to recognize that, yeah, this person's got the passion to continue to do the work uh, and that passion can spread. Um, for me, you know, having been doing this for a long time and seeing some different facets of how um, this work is done across agencies across systems, wanting to make sure that the collaborations are there and trying your best to uh, foster relationships and not throw relationships away is important. Um, recognizing that everybody contributes uh, from Rainey, someone like, you know, you mentioned being new to doing this work to someone who's been doing it for 30, 40 years. We're all the same and wanting to make sure that, that this movement sustains itself that there'll always be people who wanna press forward. There'll always be people who are willing to push the boundaries. They're always willing you know, to be people who are in the movement who, who say, you know what, I'm, you know, I may not understand, but I'm, I'm willing to do it. Um, that's, that's important, um, I think. And uh, just continuing to partner uh, with people and in, in, in wanting to see this work continue, I think, um, is important. And so that that goes, it has to be well-rounded. It can't just be, okay, I'm gonna focus on my one niche. Sometimes it has to be, well, what about policy? Well, what about, um, you know, funding? Well, what about uh, systems and how those systems work and how can we infiltrate them? Well, what about uh, on an individual level, how uh, those people are impacted by this specific initiative what about joining this initiative? What can you do um, that's gonna help sustain the work and sustain the, the ability to pay people to do the work? So it's, it's really, those are some of the things that I, I find myself um, now looking at and how that uh, can be um, useful to, you know, from at the, the very top right down to the, the very bottom, so to speak, of advocacy. Um, Every piece working together is important. And uh, I know when people have their sort of blinder on and they're doing their specific job, it's hard to see that. Um, but as someone who's been in each position um, and has sort of worked her way through a lot of different situations, it's interesting to see how they all work together. And it's, it's not always, it's not always, it doesn't always look like it, 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 it works or it flows, but it really, it really does. And it's so important that they work 
um, magically and the communication is there and, and those things um, are working harmoniously because each piece is so, so needed. And it's been really, really um, amazing to see how those things work and, um, and be a part of it. Um, that's the humbling thing to me is how I've been able to be a part of different uh, processes within this movement um, has been amazing to me. Right down to, uh, it's been amazing to see how the focus has shifted a little bit onto social justice and racial justice and understanding that DV and SA, domestic and sexual violence, like those things do play a part in the you know, systemic changes that need to happen. Yeah, you're working your work within this particular community, but it all impacts racial justice. It, it impacts uh, uh, so far uh, wide uh, and reaching that, you know, it's, it's easy to forget that. Um, but I do appreciate that we've really started looking at that and how those things uh, intermingle with each other. And Rainey, I think you pointed that out as well, that continuing to learn not just about my specific niche, but what about this? And what about those things that all impact the work that I do is, is really important. Thank you, both of you so much. So as we wrap things up, I want to welcome you to share any final words you would like um, with our audience today. And uh, let's start with you, Amanda. Final words. Um, it sounds so finite, <laughs> um, but it's not. Uh, for me, it's something that it's, it's the thing is people, unfortunately, and we've lost several this year um, who became victims of, um, unfortunately, have lost their lives. Um, those things help to impact you in such a way that you want to keep working, that you want to keep doing what you're doing to help sustain the work. Um, all those things, everything shapes me. And there, there have definitely been times when I've shown it outwards. I can think about the situation I shared earlier about the young woman who, who committed suicide. Um, and, I, and I've had several clients um, um, that have died under suspicious circumstances or unfortunately uh, were killed or um, committed suicide. Um, and I, and it was visceral for me, um, that moment. Um, I mean, I bawled my eyes out. I, you know, this one specific, all of them impacted me greatly, even those that I didn't work with. And I don't, you know, always show it outwardly, but in this one particular case, it was so visceral because things had happened, um, and you spent hours with someone and then to find out that all of these things transpired and now they're gone. Um, just letting those things when they hit you, for me, the biggest takeaway is letting those things motivate you to want to continue, not letting it discourage you, not letting setbacks discourage you, but continuing with the fight because it is a fight. We don't like to think of it in such a way, but it is a fight to want to have people treated equally and fairly and justly and honestly. It's a fight. And that goes across all systems. I'm not just talking about domestic or sexual violence. I'm talking about looking at human decency and human beings as I'm, my blood is, is red like yours when I bleed. And wanting to really look at society in a way that what am I doing to help shake things up? What am I doing to help uh, teach someone? Um, looking at moments, you know, piece by piece, how, you know, the pieces can add up to something big. It's not looking like a full picture right now, but, you know, when you look back later on the things that you've done in your life, the things you've done for advocacy, how those things add up to, wow, I've created a picture here and it's a brilliant one. Um, and, and that's my hope is that 
that that's something that I've been able to do and can continue to do and to help other people to do as uh, we go forward because it's a fight that we're all in together, not allies with each other, but we are accomplices in this fight. And that's, you know, that's, that's always gonna stick with me. I think everything that you say, Amanda, is just so incredibly inspiring. It's so, oh, I just feel so special to have been able to share this space with you. Um, and I think, you know, yeah, it's just, it's incredible to be a part of this and to just hear everything that you have to say and even just have the guidance from Ariel and from Diana. Thank you all so much too. Um, but I think for final words, I just want to say kind of, especially for those in the advocate, advocacy community, whatever you are doing and however much of it you are doing, it is enough and you are enough and you are important. You play an integral role in our fight towards justice and our fight towards liberation. Um, and then also, you know, just keep doing what you're doing and it's okay to mess up sometimes. It's okay to do things quote unquote wrong sometimes. Um, and we're all in it to grow and learn together. Um, I think, yeah, yeah, it's just very special to be able to be here and to be able to talk with all of you. So thank you. Yes, thank you, Rainy. Thank you, Ariel, Jane Doe. But this has been a privilege and a pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Um, this is definitely humbling. So thank you for sharing your time with us today. As we wrap up, I want to share some information with you. Um, first, where you can find New Hope and the Center for Hope and Healing, newhope.org, and then on uh, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at New Hope Inc. And uh, as for the Center for Hope and Healing, and especially if you want to find out about uh, a little bit more about Rainey's uh, book club and all of the fun events going on uh, in June, uh, you want to go to chhinc.org and then on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at chhlobal. And as we wrap up, just a reminder to you, um, thank you for joining us. And if you are uh, if you are looking to reach out to anybody, to an advocate who would like to um, find help, uh, you can go to janedoe.org slash find help. The National Sexual Assault Hotline is 800-656-HOPE. That's 800-656-4673. And then SafeLink, the Massachusetts Domestic Violence Hotline is 877-785-2020. Again, that's 877-785-2020. Thank you again for uh, spending your time with us today and safe and protective wishes to you and yours. Take care, everyone.